Hello and welcome to Fintech Forward, a legal guide for busy fintech professionals, a podcast created and produced by K&L Gates. Each episode is designed to highlight emerging developments and cutting edge advancements typically seen in the fintech space. We hope you enjoy our podcast. Hello, this is Judy Reinerson. Welcome back to our global fintech series. We are now lucky to be talking to my partner, Felipe Creazzo from our Sao Paulo, Brazil office. And uh, just like everyone else around the world, the fintech marketplace has gone through changes and impacts due to this uh, you know, once in a century pandemic. And so we want to start off, Felipe, asking a little bit about how Brazil is doing and and how do you see the marketplace reemerging after the pandemic? Hi, Judy. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for having me. Uh, Well, Brazil has been affected severely during last year, during 2020, which which was the, the, the the peak of the the pandemic here and retail was severely affected. So this impacted the purchase power of the population as in general. But in 2021, right now, we're looking at a a good prospect of recovery for the economy as a whole. We're looking at, uh, you know, high stock market numbers, we're looking at a uh, positive GDP number at the end of the year. We're mm-hmm. expecting a 5.5% growth in the GDP, which is That's a good, great. Yeah, it's a good number. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we still have an issue with inflation right now and unemployment rates. But in general, the pandemic also boosted uh, the remote and internet e-commerce. So... There was yes. negative aspects, but also some some good aspects about about the uh, the push for electronic commerce. That all makes sense, and and I think that is similar to what other countries and jurisdictions are finding. So, what is the current picture of the fintech ecosystem in Latin America and in Brazil specifically? Well, Latin America today is probably the most prosperous region in the world for the development of fintechs. The region has more than 650 million people divided into 33 countries with a huge consumer market that is non-bankerized or sub-bankerized. So in terms of retail banking, there are only a few large financial institutions controlling almost all of it. For instance, in Brazil, you have... 81% of the retail banking market held by five financial institutions. So it's almost like an oligopoly. So there's still a lot to be developed in terms of digital banking and financial services in the region. Fiat money, for instance, is the the main means of payment for the vast majority of the population. So all these factors combined, they create a very favorable environment for the development of fintechs. Brazil in particular has a large economic power and a digital innovation culture that helps even further these types of development. Hmm. So in the first quarter of 2021 alone, the Brazilian fintech startups received $517 million in investments according to the uh, Distrito report, which is a specialized fintech report. Wow. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's great. Yeah, to this moment, there are around 1,160 fintechs in Brazil and these numbers should keep increasing, especially in view of the favorable regulatory environment, investments by VCs, and even a growing number of M&A transactions in this sector now because of the more mature fintechs that are in the market. Hmm. Yeah, um, and that all sounds like good news. So how diverse is the Brazilian fintech ecosystem? Well, the, the fintech ecosystem in Brazil is very diverse and successful. The, the three largest categories are payment processing, credit, and back office. But there are also several other categories, such as insure tax, cryptocurrencies, financial services, crowdfunding, personal finance organizers, and others. So there's a there's a wide range there. And Mm. And yeah, traditionally, Brazilian fintechs were focused on one specific category or solution. But what we see now more and more often 
is mature fintechs offering more than one solution. As an obvious example, we can mention Nubank, which offers credit, digital account, and insurance, and eBanks, which offers credit, digital account, insurance, payment processing, and investments. And there are other multi-category fintechs, such as, you know, PagSeguro, Stone, C6 Bank, and others. And what's interesting, yeah, what's interesting right now is, is a new trend, which is, you know, because of the complexity of the Brazilian fintech ecosystem and, and the increasing level of competition in this, in this sector, we've been seeing fintechs recently that are focused on tailor-made financial solutions to some specific sectors of the economy, such as agribusiness, real estate, health, energy, and others, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's a very diverse ecosystem. In terms, of, in terms of model, for instance, a bit more than half of the Brazilian fintechs are B2B, about 25% are B2C, 13.6% combine both models, and 5% are B2B2C. And in terms of investment concentration, and because of the presence of more mature neobanks, such as New Bank, the digital services category concentrates more than double the funding of the other categories. Interesting. That is remarkably diverse. So one thing that a lot of other jurisdictions have found is that during the pandemic, uh, there was a bigger movement away from cash towards online payments and contactless payments. Are, Are people using contactless payments in Brazil? Oh, absolutely. More than ever before. The coronavirus pandemic boosted the use of contactless payment mm-hmm. in Brazil. This, this mechanism reached around uh, $8.2 billion in transactions during 2020, which represents an increase of 470% as compared to uh, wow. 2019. Right. Yeah, so it exactly. has really, really boosted that method. The, the, the pandemic and this means of payment is offered by both traditional banks and also by technology companies such as the giants Google and Apple. So in Brazil, you can use contactless payment on buses, on subways, trains, even ferries. Hmm. And yeah, and during during the pandemic, already thirty five percent of consumers who carried out physical, you know, payments opted to make payments using using this technology. Yeah, that is also in line. I do think there's no question that this, you know, horrific pandemic has caused a wave of change in payments and in fintechs. One thing that you mentioned were credit fintechs. So uh, does that mean credit is being offered by non-banks, non-bank fintechs in Brazil? Yes, in fact, there are two types of credit fintechs that uh, are authorized to operate in the country, which basically provide intermediation between creditors and debtors. So the first one is what we call the direct credit entity, or SCD. And the second one is the is the is known as the peer-to-peer lending entity, which is the SEP acronym. Uh, They both require an authorization from the central bank to operate. That's true, but they are not deemed banks in Brazil. They're not considered financial institutions. When you say they require authorization from the central bank, that means that you have to go through an application process? It's like getting a license from the central bank? Okay. It's, it's, It's a bureaucratic procedure, but not as complex as when you want to become a financial institution. Per se, okay. that makes sense. A retail bank, right? Mm-hmm. So SCDs, uh, those are the credit fintechs in in the traditional sense. So they carry out operate credit operations electronically with their own resources. So they cannot raise funds from the public. Their potential customers must be selected based on consistent, verifiable, and transparent criteria. And in addition to carry out, carrying out credit operations, these uh, SCDs, they can provide credit analysis for third parties, third-party credit collection, distribution of insurance related to their operations, and also issuance of cryptocurrencies. Really? Um, yes. Issuance of cryptocurrency, that's interesting. What about SEPs? 
Well, the SEPs, they are the traditional peer-to-peer -peer lending entities. So here, they perform the classic financial intermediation, acting only as an intermediary for the contracts entered between creditors and borrowers, right? So unlike the SCDs, unlike the credit fintechs per se, they can in fact raise funds from the public as long as they as these funds are entirely and exclusively linked to a loan operation, right? To a loan transaction. Mm -hmm. So the money comes from third parties who use the infrastructure provided by the SEP for a fee simply to establish the connection between creditor and borrower. And the SEP also can provide other services such as credit analysis and collection and insurance of cryptocurrencies as well. Interesting. So while all of these fintech developments are happening, uh, are you also seeing some more regulatory activity? Uh, and what are some of the most relevant fintech regulatory initiatives in Brazil? Well, as relevant regulatory developments, we can mention the open banking regulation and the PIX regulation. PIX is the instantaneous money transfer mechanism. And these regulations were issued both by the central bank, both, both of them by the central bank. So regarding open banking, from the consumer's point of view, it's a network shared by financial players with consumer data. Okay, so the purpose is to promote competition, to incentivize innovation, and allow customers to have access to different financial services. Obviously, the, the sharing of this consumer information depends on the consumer's consent, right? Yeah. Because what happens, yeah, what happens today is that banks, they don't have any information regarding the relationship of customers with other financial institutions. So now the open banking system, through the sharing of this information over an integrated platform, financial players are allowed to you know, we'll, we'll be aware of the products and services contracted by customers of other banks, which allows them to offer more advantageous products and services to these consumers. So this kind of boosts the competition. It right? does sound a little bit like the open banking initiatives that I've seen in Europe. And it is very advantageous, not only to the financial institutions, but also to the consumers. Absolutely. They, they are the, the main beneficiaries of this, of this system. Now, in connection with, with data protection, according to the data protection law, in, a, in addition to consumer consent, is consumer data sharing can only take place in relation to the specific data that is authorized by the consumer. And the institution may only use it for the exclusive purpose informed to the consumer. So... Yeah. It's, it's kind of strict in terms of data protection, but good, good. It's, it should still, be. it's still being implemented right now, and it should generate the creation of new fintechs in the market, helping these institutions to you know, share the information and offer financial services. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a good regulatory initiative. Now, I, I mentioned also PICS, right? So... PIX is an instantaneous payment and transfer mechanism. And that's what, spelled P-I-X. That's okay. right. Okay. P-I-X. So it. It, it runs on a platform that is managed by the, cent, by the Brazilian Central Bank, which has been adopted by financial institutions, fintechs, payment arrangers, and other financial players, right? So what we had before PIX was that payments and transfers were made by me by by means of wire transfers, card transfers, bank slips, you know, phone calls to your bank, and normally they required the transfer or or the payor to know all the banking details of the transferee or payee, right? Mm -hmm. But now they can be made simply using a cell phone and you don't even need to know what institution the other person has an account with. Ah, the other person has an account. That's yeah. good. But it's fantastic. You simply, you simply carry out the transfer, for example, to someone in your contact list using that person's passcode given to you. So you punch the passcode and boom, the, the, <laughs> the banking information will be there and you hit the button and you make the transfer. 
or you can make a payment using a QR code. You just scan the QR code and you make that payment. So, wow. Yeah, I know lots of great features about, about Pix. And another one is that it has no time limitations. It functions 24 seven and, and the resources are made available to the recipient in just a few seconds. So the Pix platform works between banks, banks and fintechs, fintechs and payment arrangers and so on. So they all communicate with each other over this platform. So with Pix, the settlement is real time, as I said, and the, and the payer and the receiver are notified of the completion of the transaction when it's implemented, right? And mm-hmm. it's already being it's already implemented. Most mm-hmm. banks and most banks and, and 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 financial players have adopted it, and it has been widely accepted by users. So everyone wow. in Brazil now is doing a Pix. Wow, and I could I can understand why it would be very popular. Very what easy. a creative solution! Very easy, very easy to use. I've I've used it many times, and it's it's both to pay and to receive, and it's just very simple. Great. Well, we've run to the end of our uh, talk today, and Felipe, it just sounds amazing. All the uh, new, rich, diverse activity that's happening in the fintech space in Brazil. And I really appreciate you sharing it with us. I hope our listeners have enjoyed this presentation and will keep following us for our future updates. So thank you. It was a pleasure. See you next time. Thanks again for listening to Fintech Forward, a legal guide for fintech professionals. New episodes are available for download through iTunes, Google Play, and other podcast applications. By subscribing to Fintech Forward, you will receive timely notifications of each new episode. Also, if you have any topics that you would like to hear discussed, please email fintechforwardsupport at kalegates.com. We would love to hear from you.